And this evening, I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. You'll see here in particular how Solomon is building on advice that he has given just prior. You may remember in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, Solomon provides counsel as to what is better. Halfway through the chapter, he says, if we are to survive life under the sun, it is better to be together. And not only is it better to be together, but it is also better to be perpetually teachable. It is better to be young and wise and teachable than old and foolish and hard of hearing. And when I say hard of hearing, I don't mean just going deaf. I mean you no longer, as he says, are able or willing to take advice. Boy, I'm glad I don't have that problem. It would be tough if I did. <laughs> just ask my mom. <laughs> Even in first grade, I was a challenge. Here, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 we are exhorted how we are. We are given advice as to how we do not become hard of hearing, but instead always sensitive and teachable to the voice of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, I'll read verses 1 through 7. I'll pray and then preach. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God to draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know what they are doing is evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much busyness and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin. And do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. Let me pray now for the blessing of the preaching of it. Lord... We wish not to be hasty in our speech. In the vows that we pay unto you, instead, O oh Lord, we wish to be humble, patient, and reliant upon your grace as that great moving force in our lives to bring about change and blessing. And so may we be such a people for your glory, the proclamation of your name among a sea of fools. We pray these things in your name. Amen. There's a lot going on here, and there's a lot of theological ideas that are proximate to this text that we find this evening. But the contrast, the central contrast that Solomon wishes to draw is the contrast between made-up religion and received religion. Religion that is regulated and given to us by the Word of God and religion that is the invention of men. The foundation for received religion is revelation. It's God speaking. It is, thus saith the Lord. And this is contrary to the religion or religions that man invent. And at the heart of that is, did God really say? And these two religions are always at odds. And the role of the sanctuary of God is to show the futility of one and the beauty and blessing of the other. That we are to be a people who look to God and like baby birds are open to receiving the nourishment that he brings to us. That's to be your lifelong disposition, posture. How you should look at and interact with God is always to be, Lord, Teach me. I think last week I said it is to be like Samuel. Speak, for your servant is listening. Or Isaiah, who said, 
I am a man of unclean lips, and I, I live among a people of unclean lips. And then when he was commissioned, he said, I will go. Tell me what to do. I'll do it. How do we do that? We must glimpse Christ in his sanctuary and see the folly of idolatry. Two points that I want to make so that we might be helped in this this evening. The first, angels, angels in the architecture. And then second, sober and thoughtful speech. Sober and thoughtful speech. Let's look at the first point, angels in the architecture. That sounds like some sort of sophisticated book that would be on the the shelf of a very fancy bookstore. What does that mean? Well, it's a scriptural idea. It's a biblical idea. In fact, Eden itself, prior to the fall, was not just a garden. It wasn't just a place where beautiful grass was growing, the trees were there, and there were animals, and Adam would walk among the animals. And he named them. He organized them. He was doing animal husbandry. He was taking care and ordering for the purpose of moving the garden ever outward. And then he was given a wife to fill that garden. And there are all these elements that are not just true of gardens, but Eden itself was a temple. It was a place in which God resided with men. That's what a temple is. It is a meeting place. It is a sanctuary where God and men come together and they fellowship. And man is renewed in his physical and spiritual life. And only God can do this. Now, when Adam and his wife sinned and they were removed from the garden, those angels that once fellowshiped became guardians of that place. And they kept man out. Now, when Moses later comes along and he is instructed to build the tabernacle, it is not just simply because of aesthetics that the Lord Yahweh says to the craftsman, I want you to weave angels into the very fabric of the tapestries. These were not idols. They were indicative of the spiritual reality of the place in which God dwells. And they weren't present because of the tapestries. They're always present. Because the ambition of the Lord has and always has been and will continue to be that God will meet with his people so that one day the earth again will be a sanctuary devoted to the worship and fellowship of God as his chosen people. We are going back, in essence, to where we began but in a greater, more glorious and expanded form. What Adam would not accomplish and could not accomplish because of his sin and disobedience, Christ through the church will accomplish. Our mission is to make the world a sanctuary, which means this. And I made the point this morning. The Lord's house is but a place that we come together on Sunday, the church house, where you and I come together and we worship under a roof to be sheltered from the rain. I mean, it was cold today to be sheltered from the cold. But this house is no less a manifestation of the reality of the sanctuary of God than the parking lot is. We could move right now, pick up your seats. If you could pick up your seats, we could go into the sanctuary and have church there. And it would be a covenant renewal ceremony. Sinners would be called to salvation, and the saints would be strengthened and edified. Same thing, different location. Why? Because that place and this place, I wouldn't go into that building. You might fall through the floor. We could go to the Ed building, but none of the rooms are big enough. It's all irrelevant. Remember what Christ says in John chapter 4? It is where there is word and there is spirit. There are angels in the architecture. Wherever God goes, the hosts of heaven follow. And when we worship, we are present with Christ in the heavenly places. And so Solomon says, when you come into the sanctuary of God, you ought to come like this. This is fancy. (laughs) 
There's something to this. This place is special. And it isn't special because, I mean, I've been to some beautiful cathedrals. I've been to St. Giles, a Protestant cathedral of the Protestant Reformation in Edinburgh, Scotland. My wife and I visit a beautiful yet idolatrous Roman Catholic cathedral in Savannah. And it took my breath away, despite all of the things. I'm like, gosh, it's just way too many images of Jesus for a Presbyterian to tolerate. But the organ was blasting. And as we sat there, my wife was walking around and looking at all of these uh, little, I can't remember what they're called, she can remember, images of the passion of Christ. And I'm sitting there in the pew, and I'm looking, and this beautiful hymn is being played, and it is impossible not to be taken emotionally outside of Savannah. For a moment, I'm no longer in Savannah. I'm in a different place. When you enter into the Lord's house, a holy place, it's not because of the organ or what is around you. It is because by the Holy Spirit, you and I are in the presence of God. And when you are in a place like that, you tend to do what? This doesn't even, I mean, this may open, this mouth, but you're going, oh, it's awe. It's awe. And when you are bowled over by awe, you can't find the words, can you? What words can you use? Again, Isaiah had this experience. What would he say in the presence of Almighty God? It took God to come to Isaiah and to place a hot coal in his tongue to purify him so that he might then speak in the presence of God. And oftentimes we come into the sanctuary of God and we are flippant with our speech. We are casual with our attention. We do not address God as God. And Solomon is saying, the way in which you worship and enter into the sanctuary affects how you do everything else in life. What you do here trickles down to everything you do Monday to Saturday. So he says in verse 1, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Now that doesn't mean if there is ice, be careful. But watch how you approach the sanctuary of God. So that as you draw near to listen, it is better than it is better to listen than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Now, what is the sacrifice of a fool? Well, he will get to that in a minute. Because in the first few verses, in verses one through three, we find that principle repeated in verses four through seven and made a bit clearer. But the overarching principle is this. In the presence of God, you need to know whose presence you're in. You need to understand that you're in a holy place, that angels are all around. But it isn't just here. All of the earth is the Lord's. So even if you go to 7-Eleven and you're getting a slushy, you are to do so with reverence as a disciple of the Lord. You know in whose presence you always live and move and have your being. And so it is right for us to have this brief covenantal history of how God's presence is manifested. I said our first, Eden, then the tabernacle. The temple is just a bigger, more fancy version of the tabernacle. Same sorts of things inside. And this tabernacle and temple is manifested in the person and work of Jesus Christ as he fills his covenant people. We are the temple of Christ as we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And the ambition, the purpose, the, the plan of God is that all the world might not just be a mission field, but converted unto the worship of God. Uh, I think it is, this, this is who I heard it from. John Piper says, the reason why missions exists is because worship does not exist. That the point of human life is to worship 
that the purpose of the church isn't missions, it's worship, and missions exist because worship does not exist. I think it's a pretty good point. We go out for the purpose of making worshipers so that we may no longer make the sacrifice of fools. Now, what is the sacrifice of a fool? I asked that question already. Let's continue. They do not know what they are doing is evil. And then he says, be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much busyness and a fool's voice with many words. Now, what are, why is he now talking about dreams? And he does it twice. And what he is saying is this. I said it already. The foundation for how you structure and organize a religion is either built on revelation or imagination. The whole Mormon religion is built upon a dream. The dream of a man who received gold and tablets. Now, I'm not mocking the ludicrousy of that, except to say it's not true. We believe that God appeared to a man in a burning bush. Now, you may say, well, that really happened. <laughs> yes, it did. And I don't believe that the angel Moroni appeared and said, this is the true religion. Or that Muhammad received in a vision instructions. Those things are false. Those things are imagination. And the reason that they're, imagined not, they're not true is because they are not the voice of God speaking. God has revealed himself to men. And if you wish to worship like a fool, this is how you will do it. You will come up with it on your own. And the church is full of this. And it's everywhere. Why do men do this? A very simple reason. We think we know better than God. What works? And how many people have bankrupted their lives emotionally, financially, physically, and spiritually because they thought, well, not me. I won't make the same mistakes. I know better than God. And so oftentimes we come into the house of God and this is how we displease him. We'll get to the second one in a minute in terms of paying vows. But we say, this is what will work. This is what we're going to do. And we, we nest our religion and our piety, that is the pursuit of holiness, piety, righteousness, in something other than what God has said. Something arbitrary. You don't know what an arbitrary rule is. Arbitrary rules are rules that exist with no righteous reason. I gave an example the other day to my Bible class, and I said... One of the rules that we have in our family is every Friday, everyone has to wear purple. And my kids would look at me and say, what does that have to do with anything? Nothing. Well, why? Because it's a rule. And the degree to which I hand down a sentence that is unjust also reveals the arbitrary nature of that rule. We live among men that delight in arbitrary rules. One of those arbitrary rules is we have no idea and cannot say when human life begins and ends. And so you know what we're going to do? We're just going to say mm, wherever we want, right here. And the Christian looks at it and goes, even children. Children are the greatest litmus test for arbitrary rules. That just doesn't make sense. Well, you're just not sophisticated enough. You don't have a degree in philosophy or medicine. So how do you know? And this is the world in which we live. In fact, it is those with more letters behind their name that tend to fall prey to greater arbitrary rules. Why? Because their life is built upon a sophisticated system of pushing out God's revelation and building their life upon the sand. This is what Solomon is talking about. He's saying very clearly that your disposition before God as one who is called to listen to your master cannot be done if you come into his presence and you don't stop talking and you will not listen. And 
As I said, I was expelled from my first grade homeschool. I didn't make it past first grade. And do you know why? Well, if you know me well enough, you know this about me. I don't stop talking. <laughs> now, part of that is me seeking to express and process ideas. Part of that is what? Well, I know. I know it, right? So if I know it, then I'm going to communicate it. And people need to know what I know. And so I think, I should just keep talking. <laughs> but how many people really need to know what I know? And what do I know that is so essential for people to know? What do I have to say? In fact, it is pastors that often run into the greatest amount of trouble. Oftentimes they endeavor to do things that work or work quickly. And they may not be right, but they are practical or pragmatic. And this is not the right standard. Therefore, Solomon says, let your words be few. Let your words be few. Because the very heart of all Christian discipleship is come and hear. Remember what the woman at the well says? Come and hear what the man who knew everything about me has to say. Come to listen. Come to listen. Speak little, listen more. Second point, sober and thoughtful speech. So what about when it comes time to speak? If we are to be slow to speak and quick to listen, he then builds upon this idea that we are not to be those who invent the way in which we come to God. God has revealed that clearly in his word. We call this the regulative principle of worship. The regulative principle of worship states, however God wants to be worshiped, he's told us how to do that. And we are to, we are to build our house upon that principle. But when we, <clears throat> excuse me, when we do come, one of the elements of worship is paying vows to the Lord. Now a vow is what? It's a promise. It's a solemn promise. And when you come into the Lord's house and you confess your sin, like we did this morning, one of the vows that you ought to continually make before the Lord is, Lord, help me not to sin. I endeavor to do better. Now here is a rash vow. Lord, forgive me of this great sin. I will never do it again. Or Lord, if you forgive me, I will give all my money to the poor. Or as Luther did on that night in which he was running in the rain and lightning was crashing all around, he didn't even pray to God, he prayed to St. Anne because he believed that you have to pray to the saints to get to God. St. Anne, if you would but deliver me from this lightning storm, I will become a monk. And I can imagine in Martin Luther's old age, he looks back on that moment and goes, well, I know that God used all of this to bring me to him, but what a rash vow. A rash vow is a vow that you make in order to do what? To guarantee something to happen. Why do we do this? Well, before we get to answering that question, because I think we know why we do it, we need to understand the, the instruction. Look at verse 4. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. And so in view of the previous exhortation to be careful with what you say, we are to contemplate when we are in worship what we are saying to God that we will do, what we are offering. A vow is a sacrifice. And for that reason, vows are costly. They cost us something. And it is right within worship to offer a sacrifice, a vow to the Lord. But we ought not to do it as the pagans do it. In our own imagination, thinking that God operates like men. Here's the question as we're moving forward. What do you have to offer God that he doesn't already have? Have you ever played those games, the trading board games? I'll trade you three sheep for one road. Because you need a road to build the civilist, the, the whatever. I'm thinking of Catan in my brain right now. And I've got all these other games now filling my space in my head. And so you make a, an exchange. 
What do you have? What do you have? Or Jephthah's vow. Remember that one? That was a bad vow. Why did he do that? Because we think God interacts with us in the same way that we interact with one another. We make vows oftentimes before the Lord so that we might show him the depth of our devotion so that he might be pleased with our vows. Now, what the Lord loves in terms of sacrifice is not the sacrifice, but the heart of the sacrificer, the one who offers the sacrifice. In fact, what is better even than that, we read, is obedience, devotion. Here is what we often do. Rash vows are oftentimes, in terms of spiritual devotion, putting something on the altar other than ourselves. Because we don't even really mean what we say. We just think that if we sprinkle some magic vow dust on our little situation, it will relieve whatever problem we have. And so we say, Lord, if you can just convince the girl to say yes, I will wash my parents' car every day for a month. Just get her to say yes. You know what I mean? We're trying to sort of use the Lord as, I wish I had a magic lamp up here and I can use it as a, Lord, it's that time. I need something from you. I'm, I'm praying to you now. And if you do this, then I will do X. Hmm. This is what our confession says about lawful oaths and vows. Did you know there was a chapter on vows in the Westminster Confession? You got to get to chapter 22 to see it. A lawful oath is a part of religious worship, wherein upon just occasion, that's a fitting occasion, the person swearing solemnly calleth God to witness what he asserteth or promiseth and to judge him according to the truth or falsehood of what he sweareth. Okay. Behind all of that, King James English, is you are saying, Lord, bear witness to what I am promising. And in the same way that you never go beyond the boundaries of what is God's, God witnesses everything. Children, this is why you should never say to your siblings, I promise. Do you know why you have to say that so much? Because so many times you have said you would do something and you never did it. And then you raise the stakes. I promise. No take backs. <laughs> and then there's other qualifiers as your word is, is sort of... Uh, shown to be less and less trustworthy. Christ knows whether or not we're going to pay the vow, doesn't he? Ever before we make it. But what we're endeavoring to do is cajole him to do something for us. And this is not good religion. This is, in fact, the very heart of idolatry, and it is a very pagan practice. Do you know why the Romans had so many gods? so that they could assure themselves that if they pay vows to some deity in heaven, something would happen on earth. There's the God of the harvest, the God of rain. And your whole life is spent constantly trying to appease all of these other gods, these multitude of deities. How exhausting is that? They would do it to the point that they would take their infant children and they would sacrifice them in the arms of a molten hot God just so they could eat. That's the other side. And this is what Solomon says, we need to be very careful that we do not act that way. Instead, we are to be slow in the vows that we make do not let, verse 6, your mouth lead you into sin. So why do people vow? In order to get God to do something for them in exchange for what they do for God. 
And all of those vows are always something particularly special and near and dear to your heart, aren't they? It requires responsibility or sacrifice. When you get married and you make a vow, you make a vow not only before men, but primarily you're making a vow before God. And then you realize the cost of that vow. The cost of that vow is what? This person and no other, in better and in worse. All of those things that come into it, all of a sudden you realize, uh, why didn't people tell me? Like, what this vow would cost? Whether you're signing a contract or entering into an agreement, there is cost. And the reason why we back out of those vows is for the same reason we make them in the first place. Because it's too hard. It's costly. And again, the question is put to us. Why do we make them in the first place? In order to put God on the hook. To compel him. To manipulate him. To do something for us. Because that's how men think of religion. That's how pagans operate. And it is a dead end. It is an utter and absolute dead end. And this is why Solomon repeats there at the end, verse 7, for when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. It's a mistake, you may say. I didn't mean it. And God says, no, you meant it. You may not have understood it, but you said it. And instead of gaining the favor of God, what do you gain for all of those rash vows? Anger and displeasure. So what then is to be our technique? How are we to act differently? What is better? Well, it is to not make the sacrifice of fools. Don't say it if you don't mean it, and you better learn what is pleasing to God. In fact, what is more pleasing to God is to be slow in your vows that you make to him and quick to believe and stand upon the vows that he has made to you. And what has God promised you? That if you lean upon Christ for salvation, you will be saved And you need not make any special vows in order to enhance or improve or guarantee the vows of God. In fact, oftentimes we make vows to God because we do not believe the vows he's made to us. We doubt him. And so we think we'll do better. These are works of super arrogation. You know what works of super arrogation are? It's not... That's what I always think is the sprinkler out in the yard. That's irrigation. Works of super erogation are the works that are not say commanded in Scripture, but if you do them, you get bonus points, like helping old ladies across the street. And we even have thought of these things as ways to force God's hand to be gracious to us. But our good deeds are what? Filthy rags. So contractually speaking, in our relationship before the Lord, what do you bring to the table? What dowry do you present to him? Our works are filthy rags. You come empty-handed. As we sing, uh, empty, I can't remember the words right now, but I just, I, I remember this line, naked we come to him for dress. Helpless look to him for grace. Not what my hands have done, we sing. That is a religion of grace. And there is a fancy theological word for this, monergism. Monergism means God begins, finishes, and does everything in the middle. He is the one who is the primary operator in the work of salvation in us. And so don't believe, don't have a religion. Reject the religion that requires Rash vows. Strange fire religion does not bring holiness. It incurs the wrath of God. So what instead? Embrace the way in which wisdom comes. By listening to God, 
living according to his promises. And when the time comes, say, Lord, help me. Help me. Make vows, but do not do them in order to earn the favor of God because you will incur his wrath. Rather, make vows, seek the Spirit's help, and walk in holiness before him. Stop promising, start listening, and you will grow in devotion to the Lord. Let's pray. Oh, Lord.